and chivalric love in Land Ball and Knight of the Cart, which are two Arthurian texts. So um, essentially my paper was looking at the binary of arms and the moors and how they um, affected the main characters of uh, my two texts. So essentially I'm going to, I'm about to explain to you what these two concepts mean and then I'm going to go into an explanation of how, um, a summary of both of my texts and then tell you how um, the characters were affected. So first is arms, which can also be um, thought of as chivalric love. And um, essentially, so this is thought of, so it designates how knights interact in the public sphere with other knights, and it acts as a chivalric code within the courtly structure. So essentially, knights gain recognition and a chivalric identity through their phys physical actions and deeds. And one of the most important physical actions that they can do is the quest. And um, depending on how successful or not su successful they are in these quests is, um, is how their status is lowered or raised in the um, courtly sphere. So um, one thing to note about this is that while it is always homosocial, it is not always romantic or sexual. So. The other half is amours, which can also be thought of as courtly love. So this, whereas arms um, designated how knights interact in the public sphere with other knights, um, amours designates how knights interact in the private sphere with their female beloveds. So whereas arms um, was not always romantic or sexual, amours is always heterosexual, and it is always explicitly romantic, if not also sexual. So like I said, amours can, is also termed as courtly love or amour courtois, and this term was first introduced in 1883 by Gaston Paris, who based his definition on one of my texts, which was Christiane's Night of the Cart. So he says that um, courtly love was of a particular kind, illicit and therefore furtive, yet marked by an almost religious devotion of the lover to his lady. So because he based his definition off Lancelot and Guinevere, who are arguably one of the most famous adulterous relationships in um, English tradition. Um, amours of most commonly refers to adulterous relationships, which also explains why amours must be constrained to the private sphere. So it's also <coughs> significant to note that um, adultery did not have the same consequences as it does now. So. Um, Marriage back then was more whoops, was more of a um, political transaction than an emotional bond. So where the betrayal was not an emotional one, if the the betrayal was not that the woman fell in love with another man, it was if she had if she got pregnant and gave um, her husband an illegitimate heir. Um, so Amoris wasn't looked um, down upon as much as long as the woman did not become pregnant. So um, my paper looks so. These two concepts were set up as a binary in a lot of Arthurian texts, and a binary, if you don't know, is um, two concepts that are set in opposition to each other. So they are seen as public and private spheres. They're two distinct, separate spheres, and um, knights can gain their identity through arms in this public sphere. However, they cannot gain it in amours because um, they are interacting with women, and it's remained private, and because women have no um, influence, in court or in the public sphere, they can gain an identity in amours. However, my thesis, which is through the analysis of Langval and Lancelot's interactions with both fellow knights and their female lovers in Marie de France's Langval and Christiane de Troyes' Knight of the Cart, the supposed binary between arms and amours breaks down to reveal that amours provides the foundation for knights to be successful in arms. So, in other words, I argue that this binary is false um, one of the most important arguments that I made was that, um, so I mentioned that in arms, one of the most important ways that knights get their identity is through quests. Um, however, women are commonly the subject of these quests. So Dorsey Armstrong, who is an important Arthurian um, medievalist scholar, she writes that the homosocial knightly masculine community depends on the feminine for de definition. Acts of service to ladies help identify knights as legitimate participants in the round table community. And so while there are, there are other methods um, for knights to gain a chivalric identity other than quests, which I do talk about in Land Ball, um, it is interactions with women that produce the easiest, clearest means of identity consolidation for knights. 
So it is actually possible for women to give knights a stable chivalric identity. So <clears throat> we're going to first look at Knight of the Cart, and I'm um, going to give a brief summary in case, because I don't know how, how many of you guys have read any Arthurian texts? I guess very few of you. Okay, so I'm going to give you a brief summary <laughs> and then um, explain to you a couple of instances that I think um, most um, support my thesis. So Knight of the Cart is um, essentially starts out with in King Arthur's court, a bad guy from the Legion comes and he says, hey, I have um, a lot of your people imprisoned in my land, and if one of your knights is willing to escort one of your out into the forest and fight me, whoever wins will get both the people in Guinevere. So Kay goes with Guinevere, he loses, Guinevere goes back with the Legion, and then Gawain goes to try to rescue Guinevere. So along the way, he meets an unnamed knight who he later learns, Lancelot, and he is also deemed the Knight of the Cart. And they go and they eventually separate and one of them goes to the underwater bridge and Lancelot goes to the sword bridge. He eventually gets to the land of Logris, which is the place where everyone is imprisoned and um, he fights Malegiant, wins, wins, um, gets one of your back, gets all the people back. So um, I argued that Knight of the Cart um, in this story, the binary is inverted. Um, but only for the reader. In the text itself, for the characters, the binary is actually reinforced because they see Lancelot doing a lot of heroic deeds and they see him gaining a stable chivalric identity. However, the reader sees that um, his actions are entirely motivated by his love for Guinevere. So the first most important, or one of the, the first instance that I talk about is um, when Gawain first meets Lancelot, who is unnamed at this point in time, and he steps into a cart. And carts at this time were used to transport criminals and other villainous people, and they were paraded through town and people you know, threw stuff at them, insulted them, and anyone who was in these carts were seen as very dishonorable, and they had no reputation. <coughs> so um, Lancelot steps into this cart in the beginning um, because the driver says that if he steps in, he will um, take him to Guinevere. So he steps in, loses his complete entire reputation and is dubbed Knight of the Cart. And for from here until a lot later on to the story, he is only referred to as the Knight of the Cart because no one knows his true name. So what's important about this and what you learn is that he is doing this entirely for his love of Guinevere. He, slan he willingly slanders his reputation for her. He um, has no qualms about completely just stepping in. Um, so because no one knows about their affair and no one knows his true motivations, um, they see him just getting into the cart and seeing him as dishonorable. So at this point, Amores becomes a significant facet of his identity. And so this inverts the binary because the binary states that a knight gains his identity through arms. However, Lancelot's identity now stems directly from the private sphere of Amores. So the second instance is when Lancelot ends up in a castle along his way and um, he spends the night there and the woman of the castle um, gets attacked by a lot of knights who are about to rape her. <coughs> So he sees this and he hesitates before helping her, but right after he hesitates, he braids himself because he says, I can't be cowardly if I'm going to save Guinevere. So he goes in, he proves himself to be extremely noble, and he um, gains the woman's respect, and he starts gaining a chivalric identity. So while um, the binary makes it seem that a knight has to gain a, a stable chivalric identity, through his association with other knights. However, Lancelot, after proving himself capable, he gains a stable chivalric identity because of, because of his love for Guinevere, because the only reason he goes into this fight is because he must prove himself worthy to um, save Guinevere. So the next instance is Lan or Lancelot is still continuing along his way, and he comes across a cathedral where there is a, a tombstone. Oh, excuse me, and on the tombstone it says that this um, slab is, um, heavy enough that not 20 knights could lift it. And if one knight can lift it, then he will prove to be the one who saves Guinevere and the people of the land. So Lancelot, because he's curious and he wants to see what's under the tombstone, he lifts it, no problem. He's like, what? Um, so he he proves himself to be the savior and he, it foreshadows the fact that, and the reader knows that he is going to save everyone. Um, and this is important because you see that he is going to gain a very, very stable chivalric identity by doing all of these things. However, 
that isn't his goal. He doesn't care about saving anyone but Guinevere. He knows that, and the priest tells him there in the cathedral that he will save these people, and he essentially says that, you know, he couldn't care less. All he cares about is saving Guinevere. Um, so whatever status he gains from saving Guinevere, it's directly attributed to Amors. Um, the next instance is after Lancelot finally crosses the sword bridge and he gets to the castle where Guinevere is kept. And the king of the castle, who is Melegion's father, he praises Lancelot for his bravery and he assumes that Lancelot is doing all of this simply because he is worthy and he can do it. Um, so he is reinforcing the binary for him and other characters. However, the reader does know that, um, that Lancelot is entirely influenced by Guinevere. He's a Moors. Um, we get to see a bit of Lancelot's um, inner workings throughout the, throughout the story, and it constantly, he just talks about Guinevere the entire time. Um, so through Lancelot's loyalty to Amores, he does gain arms. The last instance, which I think is one of the most important because it might be tempting to think that, you know, Lancelot may have a small ulterior motive and, you know, okay, he is saving Guinevere, but he also could get all this renown. Um, he goes to a tournament in Guinevere's name, and at the tournament, Guinevere tells him to do his worst. And throughout the entire first day of the tournament, he essentially loses all fights. He shows himself to be completely terrible. Everyone makes fun of him. The next day, he does the exact same until halfway through the day, she tells him to do his best, and he wins the tournament, like hands down. He wins every single fight. So if he cared about his um, arms at all, he wouldn't have, um, surrendered all of those fights. He would have actually tried. But because he only cares about what Guinevere thinks of him, um, all, sorry, all of his identity exact, uh, directly stems from the Moors. So um, the main point of that is that Lancelot gains arms for the feats he accomplishes in the name of, setting, in the name of saving Guinevere, and the binary is inverted. However, in my next text, Land of All, um, I argue that the um, binary is completely deconstructed. So in Lanval, um, Lanval is a knight in King Arthur's court, and he um, starts out very poor <coughs> because he has no wealth to give away. So he goes off and he into a field where he lays down his, or he um, lets go of his horse and he just relaxes in the field. And two maidens come to him and say that their mistress, the fairy queen, wants to see him, and he goes and he sees that the fairy queen is extremely rich, richer than anyone has ever seen, and she offers him unlimited sex, money, everything, as long as one, he keeps the secret of their relationship, and two, if he, um, if he just proves, if he shows his love and promises to love her forever. So of course he says, cool, yes, I will accept that. Um, <laughs> and he goes off back to King Arthur's court, and um, it's all happy and great for a while until he goes and um, off to an orchard with some knights in this party and uh, Guinevere comes on to him and to not tell about the fairy queen he says hey you know I, I can't do this and so of course she assumes that he's gay and he gets offended by this and he says well you know I do actually have this female lover and she's better than you. So the next day she obviously gets offended by that and she tells Arthur that he came on to her and there's whole there's this whole big trial and um, Lamball, in order to prove his innocent, must prove that um, the lover actually exists. And the lady fairy queen does come, um, shows herself and proves he's innocent and then he leaves with her to Avalon. So I argue that in this story, the um, binary is completely deconstructed and Lamball is only able to gain a stable identity in the public sphere through the resources of his amours. So, the first instance is when Lamball goes off into the field and meets the fairy queen. Like I said, he sees that she is richer than anyone he has ever seen before. So she is ultimately, she is shown to be higher than Arthur. So because she has more to offer than Arthur, she gives Lamball a chance to enter into the homosocial public sphere, which is arms, and stabilize his identity as a knight within Arthur's court. So she has influence in, this sphere, in the public sphere, whereas normally women don't. So the second instance is um, when they're done dining, Lanball's horse is brought back to him and his horse symbolically represents his knighthood and his arms. So by her bringing it back to him um, where he had left it in the meadow, didn't care about <laughs> it, the fairy queen is responsible for Lanball gaining an identity within the public sphere. She is, solely she is solely responsible for his arms. She is the one who is able to give him back that chance at entering back into arms. 
Um, the third instance is when Gawain invites him to the orchard for the party. Um, he states that Lambal is very generous with his wealth and that, you know, that's one of the main, that's how the, um, I said that the quest is a way to show your, um, is one of the physical deeds that they can do to gain recognition. Another is you can give your wealth away and show that, you know, to share your wealth with other people and that's what he does. And Gawain states that that's one of the reasons why, um, one of the main reasons why Lambal is not popular. But um, the only reason he is recognized for this generosity is because of the limitless wealth that a woman in Amor has provided him. So arms is only accessible to Lanval because of this Amor's, and without it, he wouldn't be able to gain a stable and chivalric identity. Um, the fourth instance is after he is accused of, um, after, he's, after he's accused by Guinevere, and he <coughs> told Guinevere about his love the fairy queen leaves because that was one of their conditions was if he told anyone she would leave. So he, throughout the entire trial, he laments losing her. Gawain, he still has a stable chivalric identity during this time because you can see Gawain actually pledges bail for him and comes to him multiple times and, you know, asks him what he can do to help and it shows that people still care for him and people still want to help him. So he still has a stable chivalric identity, but Lambal doesn't care for any of this. He just says he only cares about the fairy queen. Um, so this is a major inversion of the binary because he is prioritizing amours over arms, which in the beginning I said that, you know, knights were, were encouraged to, in, to encouraged to prioritize arms because that is the thing that would give him a stable chivalric identity. However, um, Lambal completely cares nothing for that. The last instance is, um, and I guess also probably one of the most important is when Lambal, um, at the very end, the fairy queen, after proving his innocence, she turns away to go leave on her horse. And Lambal, without hesitating, gets on the mounting block and gets on the horse behind her in what I think is a very feminine position because normally, you know, the woman goes behind the man. So he willingly gets on there and leaves and goes to Avalon where it says at the very end that neither of them were ever heard of again. So he willingly gives up his power and his chivalric identity and everything, all of his arms, completely forgets about it and submits entirely to Amores. And that's kind of very revolutionary, the fact that he is completely willing to just give up his entire identity and go and live with his beloved. So kind of in conclusion, um, these two readings are important because they reject this traditional binary which maintains sexist assumptions that men are better than women and that men should prioritize men over women. And I think that if more Arthurian texts were read with this idea that this binary is inherently false, then I feel like there could be a lot of more interesting readings of more Arthurian texts.